Welcome! This section will cover data types and structures in R. Let's get started! Just like any other programming language you may have experience with, R provides a slew of different common data types. Now these are what you would refer to in other languages as integers or strings or logicals. R has all of the same corresponding data types. The only difference would be the way that R names these data types. So let's start with one of the most basic common data types in R. The character. This is what would most commonly be referred to as a string in other programming languages such as Java. In R, strings are called characters. Here are a couple examples. A, hello world, or any other string within quotes. Now keep in mind, you can use single quotes as well as double quotes to represent strings or more aptly character data types. Following the character data type, we have what is called a numeric. A numeric is essentially any number with double precision or any type of decimal number. These have a lot of corresponding data types in other programming languages, but in R, any number that is not an integer can be referenced using a numeric data type. So here are some examples. Obviously, 3 being an integer is also a numeric, 12.7, negative 1, and so on. Now, if you would like to refer specifically to an integer, R does come with a built-in integer data type. In order to specify and to let R know that you are referring to an integer and not a numeric, you would have to follow the number immediately with a capital L. Now, for the work we will be doing using R, which is primarily data science and machine learning, we don't really care about the very specific, minute, and nuanced details that come with these two data types. In other words, you are not expected to know the difference between an integer and a numeric. R does not cause problems if you use one in place of the other. The only thing you would have to watch out for is whether your data was meant to be represented using a numeric instead of an integer. You don't want to miss those decimals. But again, most of this is done automatically in R. The last common data type is the logical data type. This is the true or false data type. This data type also has many analogs in other programming languages. In R, you would have to use capital letters. So you have to spell true or false using capital letters. There is also a shorthand way of representing these two logical data types using the capital T and the capital F. Capital T referring to true and capital F referring to false. With the common data types out of the way, we can now learn about atomic vectors. Atomic vectors can only hold a single type. This means if you have an atomic vector of type integer, all its constituent elements would have to be of the integer data type. Likewise for character or logical or numeric atomic vectors. How do you represent missing data in R? As with other programming languages, 
missing data is an important concept to be aware of. R supports missing data in vectors. They are represented using the capital N, capital A abbreviation for not available. R automatically recognizes this as missing data. This NA representation for missing data can be used for vectors. It is important to have a representation of NA in R so that now a common question is why we even need to represent missing data. The reason for that is specifically in our domain, which is data science and machine learning, we take advantage of a lot of built in statistical functions within R. Let's take an example using the mean function. R comes with a built in mean function. This calculates the statistical mean of a vector, meaning it takes all the numbers and gives you the average. Now, if you have missing data in this vector, do you want it to be included within your calculation? If so, what would the missing data represent? Would they be represented with the number zero? Or perhaps another number? Most probably you would want to exclude missing data and just calculate an average for existing data. Luckily, the mean function in R allows for you to do this. It gives you an option of removing missing data before calculating the mean or average. This is only possible if R has an innate capability of recognizing and specifying missing data. And that is why NA is crucial for our tasks. Now, there are other special values in R. Aside from the common types that we learned about and NA, there is a special value that represents infinity and a special value that represents not a number or an undefined value. So that would be when you div divide something by zero, for example, or you try to perform an, a mathematical operation that doesn't result in a number or that results in an undefined value. We will most probably never encounter these two values. However, it is always helpful to know that they exist. Let's talk about a concept called coercion. Coercion basically means conversion between types. This is a term that may be referred to in other languages as casting. Now there are two types of coercion, implicit and explicit. Implicit coercion happens when a data type is forced into another data type or cast or coerced into another data type due to circumstances or context. And I will show you examples in our R Studio session in the following videos. One example would be when you are dealing with strings and one data type of integer is passed in R may implicitly coerce this integer into a character. Again, we will see examples of this in the following videos. Explicit coercion happens when the user or programmer explicitly coerces a type into another type. 
One example would be if you have an integer, let's say the integer five, and you would like to pass this into a function that requires a string. You can use built in casting functions within R to explicitly coerce this integer into a character type. Once again, we will be seeing examples of this in the following videos. Now that we've learned about the common data types in R, as well as atomic vectors, let us also learn about matrices. Matrices, or a matrix, is an extension of the numeric or character vectors. This is an important concept to understand. Matrices are not a data type on their own. They are simply an atomic vector with an additional dimension. This means that their type would still be either character, numeric, integer, or logical, just like an atomic vector. However, now they would have two dimensions, what we can refer to as rows and columns. We will see some examples of matrices in the following videos. Note, though matrices are a very important topic for machine learning, in R we often do not have to resort to using matrices. R allows us to use more higher level data types such as data frames for our machine learning operations. Like atomic vectors, matrices must be of the same data type. Another important note is that matrices are filled column-wise by default. This may be counterintuitive, however, it's not a problem as you are given the option to fill row-wise if needed. Elements within matrices are referenced by specifying the index along each dimension in single square brackets. This means that if you want to locate the element on the bottom right corner of a three by three matrix, you could refer to it as three comma three, meaning the third row and third column. I will show you examples of this in the following videos. Lists are another very important data type in R. This is where R starts differing from other languages and starts showing its uniqueness. Lists act as containers and unlike atomic vectors, the contents of lists are not restricted to a single mode or a single type. In other words, you can have a single list variable that contains contents or elements of multiple different data types. This could include characters or integers or numerics or logicals or even atomic vectors and matrices. Lists are fundamental to R and we will be using them a lot. Lists are also sometimes referred to as generic vectors. The reason for, for this naming is because lists can contain elements of any type of R object and hence they are generic. Lists can even contain other lists. This makes them fundamentally different from atomic vectors. Now, lists are a special type of vector. Similar to matrices, we can access different elements or particular elements of lists using double square brackets. Remember, for a matrix, we just needed a single square bracket. With lists, we need to use double square brackets. This means in order to retrieve the third element in a list, 
whatever that element may be, again, it may be a list, it may be a vector, or it may be a matrix, or even just an individual single element. In order to retrieve it, we would use double brackets containing the number three. In a vector, we just need to use single brackets. Now, the use of lists becomes evident when we start using functions. The reason for this is that, unlike other languages, our functions can only return a single object. Now, this may be a problem for some programmers. Why? Because in many cases, you need to return more than one object from a function. One example of this would be if you are doing calculations on an x, y coordinate system. You want to return a value for x and for y. Lists provide a solution for returning more than one object from a function. At the end of a function, you can package together all the different variables and all the different values and types that you would like to return from the function into a single list object. In this way, you can return any number of objects you would like. Now keep in mind, double brackets are very important for lists. Double brackets allow you to return an individual element from within a list, and it will be returned in the type of that element. Meaning, if the third element of a list is a character, using double brackets to access this element will return a character. If you use single brackets, on the other hand, you will receive another list. Data frames are probably the most important data type that we will be using within R for data science and machine learning. They are absolutely crucial and fundamental to all of the work we will be doing in this course. It is the de facto data structure for most tabular data. It's important to note that this is a data frame used for tabular data. Data frames are actually, in essence, a special type of list, where each element of the list has the same length. So you can refer to a data frame as a rectangular list. This is why it's important to note that data frames are used for tabular data. You have to make sure that all the columns are of the same length and each column would have the same data type. Now, data frames, because of their importance in R, come with a bunch of helper functions. We will be going through each of these plus more in our following videos within RStudio. Some examples are listed here. The head function returns the top six rows of a data frame. By specifying the parameter n within head, you can have R return any number of rows from the top of the data frame. The tail function does the same thing, however, for the last rows of a data frame. These two functions are very useful when you want to take a quick look at the data you have. The dim function is short for dimension and gives you the number of rows and columns a data frame contains. n row and n call and call being short for n column, are similar to dim, but only re return the number of rows and columns. str is short for structure, and this returns a structural summary of the data. We will be seeing some examples in the following videos. 
summary returns a summary of the data names column names and row names return the column and the row names of a data frame these are some examples elements within data frames can be referenced using the same convention that we learned about for matrices this means that in order to reference the element in the second row and third column of a data frame, we would use single square brackets containing two comma three. If you recall, we define data frames as a special type of list. And that is why we can refer to individual columns within data frames using list notation, namely square brackets or the dollar sign. Here is a quick summary of the different data types within R. The one dimensional data types in R are atomic vectors and lists. The difference between an atomic vector and a list is that atomic vectors can only contain elements of one single data type, whereas lists can contain elements of differing and varying data types. The two-dimensional data structures available within R are matrices and data frames. Again, the difference between a matrix and a data frame is that matrices can only contain one type, whereas data frames can contain multiple types, with the caveat that each column must have only one data type. Again, you can think of a matrix as a multidimensional atomic vector and a data frame as a multidimensional list or as a list with each element being the same length. Due to the data frame's importance in data science and machine learning, the Tidyverse ecosystem contains a package that builds upon and improves the existing data frame within R. These improved and reimagined data frames are known as tibbles. Tibbles do less and complain more, which in turn forces you to confront problems earlier. Problems that if data frames had been used would not have made themselves evident for a long time. This leads to cleaner and more expressive code. Some features of tibbles are that they come with an enhanced print function. This makes it much easier to use large data sets containing complex objects. Data sets such as these are harder to view when printed out using R's print function. Something else that makes tibbles very important, especially when using the tidyverse, is that almost all the packages within the tidyverse are unified on tibbles. This means that they are all built with the assumption that the data frame being used within those packages are tibbles. So for example, if you are using read R, which is the tidy versus equivalent to reading in data from CSV files, any imported data would be imported as a tibble. The same thing would go for read XL, which is used to read in XL files. ggplot2, for example, which is used to visualize data, also assumes that the input to the ggplot function is a tibble. However, as you will often see in our lessons, we use data frames and tibbles interchangeably. Any function that works with a tibble will also work with a data frame. Therefore, you do not have to be too worried about making sure that every single data frame you're using is converted or coerced into a tibble. Now, when we say tibbles are a simple version of a data frame, we mean that tibbles never change the type of the inputs, whereas data frames often coerce existing data or inputs into different types. 
tibbles also never change the names of variables and they never create row names. All of this is opposed to data frames in R which do all of these things and which often cause headaches. And that is why the developers of the tibble package have decided to, by default, not allow for these things to happen. And that is why tibbles are referred to as simple data frames. Another huge advantage of tibbles is that you can name columns using unconventional variable names. As any programmer would tell you, variable names are often restricted by a certain set of rules. For example, you can't have a variable name in any programming language that contains unusual characters like spaces or that don't start with a letter or that contain special characters. With a tibble, you can actually name your columns using non-syntactic variable names. In order to do this, you would have to surround your column name with backticks. Within these backticks, you can include any character and any variable name and Tibble would allow it. The Tibble package also comes with an additional very useful function called Tribble. Now Tribble is short for transposed Tribble. Tribble is short for transposed Tibble. The triple function is customized for data entry in code. Often you want to test certain code that would require a data frame. A quick way to create this data frame would be using the triple function. You can define column headings using the formula convention and each entry would be separated by a comma. Again, we will see examples of this in the following videos. This makes it possible to lay out small amounts of data in easy to read form. Now, tibbles also come with a refined print method. When you try to print a tibble, it only shows the first 10 rows of the data frame and it shows all the columns that fit on the screen. It makes it much easier to work with large data, and each column reports its name and type. Here are two crucial resources for more information on Tibbles. The first is a book by Hadley Wickham, who was often heralded as the founder of the Tidyverse. The second is the Tibble documentation as can be found on the Tidyverse website. Let's take a look at these two resources now. This is R for Data Science. You can find this book for free at r4ds.had.co.nz. This is a fundamentally crucial and important book for anybody who is interested in the tidyverse or in data science using R. Chapter 10 specifically goes into tibbles and gives you an introduction and a foundation in the tibble package. This comes with exercises at the end of the chapter that allows you to practice how to use tibbles. Tibble.tidyverse.org, on the other hand, is where you can find the tibble documentation. So here you can find an overview, installation steps, usage examples, references, articles, and much more.
Now let's practice.